the cloud, it's great. Easy that way. Um, okay, so welcome everyone. Um, so tonight we're going to be speaking with uh, Dustin Black, who is a civil engineer and working for the Michigan Department of Transportation. I have that correct, right? Yes. And uh, we always like to say that you're here as a private citizen, uh, just to cover our bases. And just so <laughs> that you know, mind. yeah. <laughs> Um, so we are the Denver Bicycle Lobby. We're kind of in Denver. There used to be a group called uh, Bike Denver, and they were kind of the official uh, advocacy organization. They sort of got swallowed up into Bicycle Colorado, and so it kind of left a hole. And we noticed a lot of us were on Twitter, kind of shouting about the same things. And we eventually met in the real world, and it's only been about a year and a half. Um, so we're still kind of figuring all this out, but it's really a grassroots group of folks that are kind of concerned. Um, we do focus a lot on bikes, but we are very interested obviously and just mobility and all of its connections to everything that that means. So um, first thing I'd like to hear from you is just um, if you could tell us about your day job and most importantly too, what is kind of the common misconception around it? Yeah, so as a, um, as a DOT transportation engineer, um, I work all the way from scoping a project, which is like the conception of a project, um, and all the way through uh, developing what's, what this project is go going to include, and, and then um, getting that programmed. Like right now, I'm working on projects all the way into 2028, and I, you know, we have our eyes on projects beyond that. Um, and I take it all the way through the design phase. We, we coordinate with utilities, we meet with locals and, and discuss their needs and, and just kind of take it all the way through the whole design process. And I, you know, hand it off to construction and then they go build it. And then I get to hear about all the stuff that's screwed up. <laughs> um, that's, you know, the, the gist of, of what I do, which is a little bit different than like a consultant uh, engineer where they kind of jump in at the design process. They miss out on that scoping and, and development and, more like programmatic type stuff and and if I had to say like the biggest misconception about like DOTs and, and the types of things that transportation engineers do it would be that part is is we're primarily asset managers so we don't you know we focus a lot on pavement condition and, and surface pavement condition and and really that serves us really really well when we are outside of a town um, when we get into into a town uh, we have some interesting conversations because we have some deteriorating pavement that really, you know, should be removed and replaced, you know, based on like remaining service life values and, and pavement distress indexes and things like that. But the, the city, you know, may or may not have enough money to, um, you know, redesign or, or reconstruct their uh, storm sewer or their, their sanitary or the water main. Um, so we get into these like interesting discussions where we just kind of mill and fill it forever because they, well, we're waiting for them to come up with some money and then, uh, you know, or, or they have a bunch of money and they want us to do something, but the pavement's like in pristine condition. So we're like, you know, we're always that, that uh, tension trying to, to align our goals. And, and we spend a lot of time doing that. And, and probably 90% of my day is like trying to figure out how to coordinate with these, these locals. Um, uh, you know, it's not very newsworthy. So of course, all you really hear about is like the, the highway widenings and, and, you know, the destructive type stuff that we're doing. Right. Um, you know, which there's that other 10%, you know, there's, you know, we do get into that realm of, of uh, you know, ex expanding our, uh, you know, infrastructure, you know, a lot of the stuff that you hear about us is, is self-inflicted. A lot of it is, is historical. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, I, I work for the DOT, but I'm my legal entity name is the Bureau of Highways. So like as a state level transportation agency, we're focused on state level infrastructure. Um, it, you know, we, so we're, we're thinking in terms of like freight and like, you know, movement and commuter type stuff. And that's where a lot of these like kind of specs come in that are really counterproductive when you get into that urban setting. And, and we're, we're just now learning how to pivot to, to get into those urban settings and not kind of screw everything up. Um, but it's, it's a painful kind of learning process. And, you know, historically we haven't been that good at it and we're still not that good at it. Um, I like to think my DOT is better than some, <laughs> but uh, 
um, yeah, so it's there, there's a process there, and it's it's uh, it's interesting to be a part of it, watching the kind of regime change and, and the new way of thinking. Yeah. Um, so I, I think uh, the biggest misconception is that we're not changing. We are, but it's just we're there's so much machinery. And it's such a monolith that we're pivoting, and it's very very slowly. Sure. So, well, I, you know, one of the reasons why I think we <laughs> wanted to speak to you is that I think a lot of us have been watching you on Twitter, and you seem like a bit of a unicorn, to be honest. Um, <laughs> You know, you, you, you talk about multimodality and safe streets and uh, pedestrian movement and bike movement and all these things. So what, uh, what started your, your sort of advocacy for safe streets? <laughs> uh, you know, it, it's funny you bring that up. I get asked that a lot, actually. <laughs> um, you know, I always thought I was just kind of doing my job. But, uh, you know, last March, when, when the world got flipped upside down, we all got sent home to, to work and you know, I started getting on Twitter more and, and kind of realizing that, you know, a lot of these transportation engineers aren't talking about these things. And uh, enough people have asked me, like, why are you the way that you are, <laughs> you know, <laughs> to where, like, I'm starting to realize, like, you know, maybe this, uh, maybe I'm some sort of, like, freakish anomaly. I don't know. Um, and, and it kind of makes me wish I had, like, this cool origin story. Like, you know, I got hit by a radioactive bike or something and, you know, like, it transform my whole worldview and set me on this path to like active transportation advocacy or something I don't know sure um but in reality it's it's much more mundane than that it's uh you know it's really just a byproduct of doing my job you know really um and I kind of think that's a good place to start because like as a public transportation engineer what is my job right it's it's to develop and design a transportation system that's um usable that's safe for users and is done so in a way that's, you know, being, you know, in good stewardship of public resources, right? Mm -hmm. Pretty, pretty simple on the, on the face of it. So, you know, in engineering school, they, they teach us to like break down these things into component parts. So like, let's take a look at that, you know, road safety, you know, we hear every day, you know, at least in, in our circles, 40,000 people a year are killed on our roads. To me, that's like an astronomical number. It's unfathomable that we're just like, okay with that. You know, that's just part of doing business. Yeah. You know, that, it's just crazy to me. And, and I don't know, if, if you think about it, there's 50 states, so that's <laughs> seven, 800, you know, per state. I've got 83 counties in my state. So say 10, 10 people in my county, in my community on average, gone every year like you know when you put it in those like realistic tangible terms it's just like unfathomable that we're we're okay with that so you know what's the answer to that you know it's primarily speed and and mass you know cars are driving faster they're coming off the line you can do 200 miles an hour right off the line totally stock cars are getting bigger um you know we're doing all these things and, and we know that people are driving too fast we know that these cars are getting bigger and bigger you know, we know that people are dying on the streets, you know, we got to do something, right? Mm -hmm. So like, there's that. <laughs> and then you go to like, you know, another part of my job is like, you know, usability. And from a, from a transportation standpoint, that's really like, you know, comfort or like congestion mitigation, right? We know we can't build ourselves out of congestion. <laughs> we, we know that we've been trying it for years. Everybody's been trying it. No one has succeeded. It's, it's yet to be done, right? In, in any kind of meaningful way. So, you know, we look at the other other style. Okay, if we can't build ourselves out, we got to shrink, you know, the the users of, of this facility. You know, mode change we're, we're talking about now. We, we look at other countries. We look at, you know, local agencies that have, have done things to encourage mode, <clears throat> encourage mode change. And they, they're almost always successful in the long run. So, so there's that. <laughs> and then, um, you know, you talk about being like a, a good steward of, of uh, you know, public resources. You know, not only is it fiscally prudent to, to not build more car infrastructure that we can't afford to maintain now, so why are we building more? But you, you look at other externalities of like, you know, climate change. Transportation as a sector is like 25 to 30% of, of global greenhouse gas emissions, depending on which, you know, studies you look at. I mean, that's huge, you know, and I think uh, Secretary Buttigieg just came out and said, like, you know, it's, it's a huge problem, but we have a, the potential to, to play a huge part in that solution. And, you know, and by the way, electricity is 
you know, depending on the report is another 25%. <laughs> so, you know, where's transportation going? You know, this is, this is a huge thing. And it, some people aren't ready to have the climate change conversation. I, you know, I get that. I, it's unfortunate. <laughs> But, um, you know, even locally, you talk about like things like water quality A report just came out that said, you know, these uh, toxicants found in, in uh, tires are, are eroding and, and going into the sea and, and basically killing all the coho salmon on the Pacific Northwest coast. You know, that's, that's pretty substantial. Uh, you know, things like road proximity air quality, you know, epidemiologists, you know, prior to COVID were we're busy like educating us about, you know, the elevated levels of, of asthma that are, are directly, you know, when you're close to a highway, you just breathe out that you have, you know, any number of, of health effects because of that. Um, and, and, you know, and, the, and equity is tied to that, you know, there's, there's people that are, um, you know, we know which demographics that typically affects, you know, we know where we're, we're expanding these roads and, and have built these roads historically. It's, it's crazy. And I mean, the list goes on and on. <laughs> there's all these factors of like, you know, we're just like screwing everything up, you know, and, and it, it all kind of, you know, goes to, to one thing. And it's like, you know, we've got to quit driving so much, yeah. you know, one way or another. Um, and I, I don't know. I mean, like I could go on and on forever. You talk about like job creation. astro has got a report that says, you know, greenways and like active trans- and transportation infrastructure um, construction is like double the job creation of what like traditional highway construction is. You know, there's like all these facts, like any aspect of society, like any ill of society that you look at, you know, getting people out of cars and into different modes, like kind of fixes it, like almost on its own. Yeah. And, it, and it's crazy that we don't pursue that. So like just an engineer doing engineering things, looking at the components and how it relates to the entire system. Like, like we kind of look at how these interact in this complex interdependent way. And it all points to one thing, you know, we got to get people out of cars. Yeah. So that, that's kind of where I'm at today. And I've, I've kind of deduced, I guess, that, you know, active transportation is really just the, the logical solution of sound engineering judgment. So. And it's, it, it's interesting to, to hear that because, you know, obviously that's how this group is thinking about things. But here in Colorado, we are currently widening uh, I-70. They're considering talking about I-25. Um, and also, I believe I-225 is up on the books now. There's things on I-70 up in the mountains. So it's almost like what kind of stops this juggernaut of sort of paleolithic thought? Because um, <laughs> we're lost. So, I mean, strong leadership at the top is going to stop something like that. You know, there's, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> We're doomed. There, there's two kind of like wars or battles going on. You know, there's like the, the national scale level where you have like the strong leadership at the top. You know, like like in Texas, they just put a halt to the I-45 freeway expansion. You know, those kinds of things are going on. Um, for, for like us, you know, a, a kind of a grassroots advocacy group and like a local kind of transportation engineer designing and cranking out projects, you know, we're really fighting, you know, not a policy war like they are at the national level, but we're fighting a culture war of, of getting things built. Um, sorry, I have a bit there. <laughs> All right, you got to go. Good night. Daddy. All right, love you too. Marshall, how do you get the <laughs> Zoom bomb. I'll show you later. <laughs> I'm sorry. No worries. Um, it's bedtime. All right, past bedtime. Um, so anyway, you know, I, I think primarily, you know, there, there's people fighting that that national kind of battle and, and doing very important work, you know, rewriting or, or, you know, lobbying to rewrite the MUTCD, you know, kind of battling some of Ashto's kind of standards or, or whatever. Um, I, I can't say too much on <laughs> that. Um, but like, you know, that battle's being fought and, and you know, that's great. I think, you know, where, where we kind of come in is, is more that street level in the city, like building relationships type of thing. And that's like a totally different ball game than what the other ones got going on. It's that ball game is really about <laughs> connecting dots and, and aligning goals and outcomes with, with other stakeholders. And that's, you know, that's a whole conversation we get in, could get into, <laughs> sure. um, but that, that's the general approach. 
it's interesting that you bring up the MUTCD. Um, <laughs> uh, I know that there's a lot of advocacy around getting comments in there to push for, for changes. Is there anything you particularly are hoping to see in the new draft? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that um, might be a very large question, but. It, it is. It, it is and it isn't. Um, I can't say too much about it. Um, even though I'm not here on behalf of my employer, I can't speak about like specific policy or specific, uh, sure, you know, changes. But I will say, you know, obviously it's very car centric, and just like any of our specs and, and guidelines, they're they're, you know, concerned with flow of, of vehicles and rather than you know capacity of of people moved or you know safety, you know, so I'd like to see um, some of the changes get reoriented in that direction. Um. I, I do want to point out, and this is kind of where I break with some of my peers um, in the sustainable kind of transportation arena, is I think there's enough wiggle room in the specs today to get a lot of the stuff done that we want to get done, at least on the ground level, you know, in this fight that we're in, you know, there's, there's, you know, we just passed around this uh, Hoboken, New Jersey thing where they, you know, emphasize crosswalks, bike lanes, uh, you know, wider sidewalks, uh, road diets, you know, all these things any engineer in any city can do today if they wanted to. And, and the biggest thing is, is understanding that, you know, you're in this culture war to convince them that it's worth it. And, and a lot of that has to do with like some of the embedded values that, that we talk about um, that are kind of baked into our specs that we do have. And if you realize their, their values and they're really should statements, not shall statements, you know, that's, that's a huge, huge thing. Um, you know, some things that come to mind are like, uh, you know, the 85th percentile speed, you know, it doesn't have to be the design speed. Um, I, I think it's state law based, but in Michigan, you can go up to like I want to say it's like your 30th percentile could be your speed. Um, don't quote me on that, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, we never use it, you know, because so, you know, it's always 85th. So I, you know, that's, that's what we do, but it doesn't have to be like that. Sure. Um, it's the, the should versus shall is a very engineering like white paper um, distinction that a lot of people, I don't think, uh, you know, I'm a software engineer, so I've seen those words a lot and I, um, but I don't think people quite understand that. And uh, I've seen you talking about like the wiggle room, and it's something that we ask planners about here in Denver a lot. Um, and, and because we see examples of them doing it, but then other times they'll tell us they can't. Um, so it, it can be very- If it's to favor cars, then it should. If it's to favor bikes, then it shall. Yes. Right. <laughs> I also want to- that works. <laughs> you, um, you had kind of talked before about um, not being a cyclist. And this is always kind of interesting to, to us because it's one of those words that has a lot of, um, it, it, a lot of connotation behind it. Some people think it's a, it's a person in spandex. You know, here we like to think it's anyone on a bike, I think, really. And it doesn't even necessarily have to have two wheels. So um, why are you not a cyclist in your mind? It's scary out there, man. <laughs> <laughs> I engineer the stuff. I know what it's like. <laughs> <laughs> and that was a question I want to ask you, too, is like if you design something, are you using it? personally, like do engineers go and ride their own designs frequently? Yeah, you know, that's an interesting question that, you know, I think transportation engineers get a lot. Um, and it's, it's a very intuitive question, you know, like, would you put your family there? Would you, would you use it? And, you know, it's, it's a good question and it's a, it's a complicated question, you know, <laughs> in some ways. I, so I work in a, a nine county area, but I also have influence in, in a broader 21 county region. So I do have some say in, in some of those places, but so, you know, so, and they're on the other side of the state in some cases. So I don't like use them every day, but you know, I, I will not design something that I wouldn't be comfortable using it for the intended purpose. You know, if, I've talked a lot of cities out of building bike lanes because they are not where you want a bike lane. They're too dangerous to, to put someone there. And, and I don't know if you want to hear that, but you know, I, I think they can do more harm than good. Cause a lot of times I'll, I'll get a city that comes, you know, we're, we're partnering on a project that's coming down the road a couple years later. They'll be like, Oh, we want a bike lane. It's, you know, it's 45 miles an hour. We've got 12, you know, five, you know, 12 foot lanes, um, it, it, you know, 10,000 trucks a, a day. And, and we're not going to change any of that, but, you know, we, 
we've got like this extra three feet here. We want to cram a bike lane in there. We call those like, murder strips. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, you know, okay. Uh, you know, and I kind of crack my knuckles like, okay, we're about to have a conversation here. <laughs> and, and, and that goes to like, you know, this culture war of, and like partnering where, where you try to dig deeper you know, I, I take the time to sit down with them and find out what they're actually trying to accomplish. And it turns out, you know, they, this particular city um, kind of saw themselves as like a family friendly city and they wanted to get like more kids out on bikes. And I'm like, this is not your bike lane, <laughs> you know, for that, you know, this little three foot of space that you can barely put a bike in, and, you know, you're not going to get that bike here. You're going to get, you know, your spandex, like road warrior, you know, and which you already get now because they're legal users of the road and they're owning the road. <laughs> sure. And so when you dig down, you, you, you kind of uncover these values of like what they actually wanted. And that morphed into, okay, now we have five lanes now, let's take two of them away and, and, you know, reallocate some space and get like, you know, attract the users that you actually want to attract. Sure. And, and those are tough conversations. You know, it's not easy to spring a road diet on someone. <laughs> right. Well, that probably leads, this will be my last question and we'll open it up to the, to the group here. Um, but I've, I've heard you speak about advocating for certain different uh, reconfigurations or designs and receiving a lot of pushback from a city. Um, what have, how have you been successful in, in convincing them or showing them that there's a, there's a different way of doing it? Yeah, um, that's a great question. And it goes back to, to connecting the dots for them and aligning what we want to do with what they want to do. And, and a lot of that is you know, perusing through, uh, it, I mean, it sounds dumb, but perusing through like their master plans or their recreation plans or, or like the DDA usually has like a downtown plan or you know, there's all these plans. Yeah. And if you can like identify uh, these, these things, you know, which is not always good because a lot of times they just like, do them because they have to, but um, you, you start to pick up trends of like what this identity of the city or neighborhood's trying to be. And, and you figure out, you know, how you can connect what you're trying to do to that you know in another city i was working in they they their their top like five goals was like more sidewalk sales you know more increased space for festivals um walkability for our aging population and like you know uh outdoor dining or something and like something else you know it was all like outdoor stuff that you know where people congregate they wanted to like generate these like uh a sporadic kind of interactions you know amongst neighbors and things like that and we're like, okay, well, let's, uh, you know, we're, we're in this road diet, <coughs> excuse me, road diet conversation. You know, what do you want to do with that extra space? Well, originally they wanted to leave it all pavement and just have it like be this tall like, shoulder type thing. I'm like, that, that ain't going to work. You know, if, if you add, you know, make, do like a sidewalk expansion, you know, you, you, you open up, you know, uh, space for people to commute. You open up space for uh, outdoor dining you open up space for site, you know, all these goals that you've already identified for yourself, you know, here's how you do it. Here's how you get there. And like, you just take all five of them out with one, one kind of move. Yeah. And, and, you know, they're kind of wishy-washy and, and then you start for each person in the community, you got to take like a different approach. You know, if I'm talking to like the, the department of public works, for example, I'm like, Hey, check out all this new space you got to flop over snow in, in the winter, you know? you don't have to get in there when you get a big heavy snowfall and get your loader on overtime and, you know, truck it out. You have a place to like flop it over in the meantime, because they're not doing outdoor dining in the winter. So people will be walking there and, you know, you've got all this extra room. He's like, you know, calculating how much money you save. And, you know, as we're talking, I can yeah. see the wheels turning. And so it's just like identifying, you know, what currency they value and connecting what you're trying to do to that, which is, is not always easy. Um, you kind of know who the players in the city are, but then you get like these private citizens and that's like a totally different ballgame, <laughs> you know, yeah. then you got to play the, like, you know, um, you know, in the context of like bike lanes, you're like, Hey, we want the same things here. You know, we both want me out of the way, <laughs> you know, I, I don't want to be in, riding over Sheros in the middle of the road with you hot on my tail. Right. And you don't want me holding you up, getting to wherever you got to go. Um, so like, that's, let's meet in the middle. Let's, it's, uh, you know, spend, you know, invest some resources and build a nice protected bike lane. I'll gladly get out of your way. And in fact, I'll put my family there too, you know, exactly. and that's a win-win. And you sell it as like, um, you know, this benefit for congestion, you know, again, that mode change aspect. Um, 
the Netherlands is a great example of that. You know, Cycle Utopia in Netherlands was just voted by like Waze, I think, is is the 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 best place in the world to drive a car. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. you get out of the way. It, it's better for all users, and it, sure. it's just. You know, in in the Netherlands, by the way, is is home of Royal Dutch Shell. You know, that's that's like the oil lobby. You know, headquarters. So, like to say it can't be done here is just you know it's it's ridiculous. We you just got to spend the money, spend the time, and do it. You know. Yeah. Well, I'd like to open it up to the rest of the group here and have them ask you some questions. Sure. So, whoever would like to go, I think you can unmute yourself now. Go ahead and fire away. Something you had said at the very beginning of your uh, first uh, introduction was uh, you go out after the engineers are done building it to see what they screwed up. And uh, <laughs> it, was, it was a flippant comment, and, and, but I was wondering if that is because um, that's just an engineer thing and, and, and you're just the guy who designs it and so that's the natural tension or if they're honestly not used to building bicycle infrastructure and screw it up. Yeah, I mean, that wasn't uh, bicycle infrastructure specific, that comment. Um, it, you know, what, what looks good on lines on a paper and, and 2D is a lot different than when you're out building. Um, I, I actually was in construction for a little over 10 years before I became an engineer. So I, I would always be like, oh, this guy, you know, this person doesn't know what he's doing, you know, they're doing. And, uh, you know, what were they thinking? And now I'm that person. So, you know, if I've got one elevation, one grade messed up and there's ponding water or something, I hear about it for like the entire year. Um, yeah, I, yeah, there's, there's a natural tension there. <laughs> we battle constantly. Who else has got a question for him? Was that oh, you unmuting that? Yeah, Dust. I, I so like when when I chat with engineers around our neighborhood, and, and granted, like I know you're on like a, a statewide, much larger project scale. Like I'm I'm talking here like <clears throat> a bike lane on Perry Street in our neighborhood, which is just it's an urban neighborhood street, right? Um, sometimes I'll get objections from engineers saying things like, "I was like, hey, like what about putting a stop sign here?" Um, and I've gotten objections of things like, well, that is a street with, it's a traffic light controlled street and we can't have a stop sign there, or we can't have a stop sign here because we own the, our policy book says we only put stop signs on this corner of the park, you know, yet at the same time, I've also seen streets where we got pressure with like city council people and things like that. And they put a stop sign on a street that was light controlled. So like, I mean, how, how do I relate to that engineer how do I speak to that engineer about like hey like I think this might not be standard but I think it's worthy of of consideration yeah that's that's a great question I've definitely seen um things change very quickly when you know right after people say they couldn't change you know and that that goes into uh, a whole realm of of like you know the warrants associated with with certain (laughs) signs and signals and things and uh, I don't want to speak too much to it because I'm not a traffic engineer. There's a little bit of a difference there. But uh, in general, I would say, you know, again, you're selling them on, on the culture, not the, the technical of it. Um, you know, you, you take them out there and, and you show them what's going on. And, and, you know, these cars are moving too fast this way, so we need to control it some way. Um, you know, kind of leave them to the outcome and, the, and they'll let them do the engineering kind of. I don't know if that makes sense at all. Are traffic engineers political appointees? Uh, they are not. Okay. It's, so they come up through the ranks and they, they, they aim for that job. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah. So it's just a, a job you apply for. Um, I, I think it, I, my personal opinion, and I break with most of the people in my profession about this, is I think it is a political job. But it's um, it is a job that you know if you have an engineering degree you can apply for, right? Because right now our DOT is arguing with our some of our DOT designers about about the 85th percentile, 
and the engineer won't let them use the whatever percentile it is that they want to use because throughput and whatever or not and it's like yeah what what's 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 your beef person why why do you insist that it has to be this way traffic engineers are engineers the way same way economists are scientists it's all made up they don't know what they're doing <laughs> i mean i agree to that uh, to a point um there's a lot of interesting things at play. Uh, so there, there is no it's a common myth that there's like this traffic engineering school that they go and like brainwash us all at. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, the, there's just an engineering school and they, and they treat it all the same. Um, and from a like a purely like physics standpoint, traffic engineering is a lot like fluid uh, engineering and, and they treat it like junctions and, and throughput and capacity and boundary conditions and all these things. And that's great for like the mechanics of it. But unfortunately, that's where like the education stops, and that's where most engineers stop. And it's only until you get out into the real world and realize, and hopefully they're paying attention, realize that there's like these whole societal, like, you know, quote unquote, soft aspect to it, um, that you you realize like, hey, this is like kind of important stuff. This isn't just like cranking numbers and you know, eighty traffic is fluid. This, it's level service this, and yeah. <laughs> so there's there's a lot of stuff that comes with it, and you know, by the time people figure that out. You know, on their own they're like already so entrenched and and that that momentum that machinery is, is very real that inertia is very real and and it's it's just a system that's designed to keep it that way you know every every manual that i have is like 1100 pages <laughs> and it's not like i have like one or two of them there you know i've got a, like 50 manuals i reference on a daily basis you know in one way or another and there's no possible way me as an individual engineer can understand every single part that's in every single one of those. And even like, you know, an office or like a small consulting firm, they don't have that knowledge base. So the, the natural tendency is to continue what's been done before you, you know, not risk, not put your neck out um, and, and just continue on that. And I think that's where a lot of these um, people stick with, they, they, they think these are shell statements or, or must do's and they're really not. They're just like, you know, you're, they're not convinced it's worth the risk of sticking their neck out, putting their name on something that's unconventional. And, and I really think that's where we as an industry, and maybe even going all the way back to the education component, need to like step up into that and realize like, you know, there are repercussions for, for doing the same thing. And, and we need to change that. We had a question from uh, Nolan in the chat. I don't know if you saw it, but I can read it out for you if you didn't. Um, says you're an EPA Clean Water Act 404 reviewer. This sounds very specific. Do you yeah, see road oh. expansion and new road construction that cites future traffic as the need for the project? How would you try to move the conversation into alternatives that aren't widening and expansion? So. I'm gonna read it in the chat real quick here. <coughs> well, I think future traffic is a farce in a lot of ways, you know, it's, there's right. only future traffic if you build more room for them. Right. So, uh, you know, induced demand works both ways. It, it, that's the, the big, you know, elephant in the room, you know, every engineer knows it's there. We don't have a way to like compute with it. And, you know, you can't, you know, you can add a growth factor, a population growth factor or a capacity growth factor to your, your traffic models, but you can't like, come in the back end and say oh here's all the demand that we're going to induce too it's like a, a pull instead of a push and it, every engineer out there knows it's kind of a joke um and uh it, it's, i don't know i it, it's one of those things where you just you got to keep hammering that conversation of of like you know we don't need to you know, we're not going to build ourselves out of congestion and we're not, we're never going to catch up with, with more lanes and wider pavement to, to like this growth or this, this population that you think we're going to have this, this traffic that you think we're going to have. If we do that, we'll create it. And then we'll be, you know, right back where we are again. So, you know, we gotta, we gotta change that conversation of to what actually works and look at other models, look at other countries, look at other, you know, some cities have, have, you know, successfully navigated the mode change and, you know, we, we really need to harness that as an industry. And that's, you know, that's a tough conversation because not a lot of people want to hear that and not a lot of people believe it because again, that's a, that's a change from the norm. You know, it's very easy to, to crank your numbers into your traffic model and be like, oh, we need another lane. Oh, let's build another lane. Who cares? You know? Sure. 
and, and to steer away from that is, is very difficult. Uh, Gary, you had a question. Do you want to unmute and ask it? Oh, hold on. Try again. There we, there go. we go. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Rob. Dustin, uh, a lot of community meetings are taking place in Denver because we recognize that if we're going to change mode, we need protected lanes and not the painted stripe. And right. we get into residential neighborhoods and the local neighborhood is adamant. They are not going to give up their street parking. I mean, they're making eminent domain arguments. You know, you're decreasing the value of our home. We have a right to park on the street and really it's public space. So it's a argument about, it's a cultural war and it's an argument about who owns this public space. Right. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts on that. <laughs> um, or, or in a, in how a to win that? Well, the way you win that is you, you activate your decision makers that are willing to do it. In, in the face of that. Um, there's a lot of arguments to be made to those individual homeowners. You know, you can talk about things like, you know, your, your tax money is uh, subsidizing your, your free car storage. Um, it, you know, it's costing the, your municipality or your state money, you know, every 10 years to, to replace that pavement. You know, there's all these costs associated with, they don't care. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and you could say you could till till you're blue in the face. You can say we're legal road users too, and you know we deserve the space just as much as you do. Uh, you know it, they don't care about that. <laughs> you can talk about um, you know they, those types of people tend to think they're the only ones that pay for the road. That way, you know they're the only ones that can uh, you know legally or should have the right to use that road, and that's a total farce too. And you can bring up like how the highway trust fund is totally insolvent. I you know I actually looked this up before I got here. You know, Michigan uh, user fees only cover like 60% of, of the funding that goes into roads. In Colorado, it's like 51%. So the rest of that comes from, uh, you know, income tax, uh, bonding, um, you know, millages, you know, things like that, all these other taxes, you know, sales tax. And, and so you're paying just as much for that road as, as they are. And, and really, you have to take all those things and convince your decision makers to to spring it on them, not, you know, have a study, not, uh, you know, have these meetings where we hear them out. It, it doesn't work. It, that's a failed system. And you really need to convince the people that have the power to do this to take what's known as the JSK mission uh, uh, approach, which is um, basically how uh, Janet Sadat Khan did it in, in New York City. They just like went over a weekend and just went and did it and then asked for forgiveness later. You know, sometimes they had to backtrack, but a lot of times, you know, it was so successful after like the sorting out kind of period initially that it became a win. And, you know, and they've had some heated battles too and, and some eminent domain issues and, you know, and you, you got to have the leaders that are willing to take that on because it's the right thing to do. And that kind of goes back to um, a previous question from John, I think, about whether these are political positions or not. And, and this is why I say that they are because we, you know, for all intents and purposes, at least at the state level and federal level, city's a little bit murky, but we operate as part of the executive branch, right? We get a new governor, we tend to get a new director, we get new initiatives, we get new programs and, and new funding, and, you know, everything kind of gets shaken up, just like any other part of government. And, and really, we, you know, as the executive branch, we should be enacting policy. Um, and if we truly believe that you know, they don't, you know, people don't deserve free car storage, you know, free private property storage uh, on public resources, on public land. And if we believe that this way is safer and it's, you know, from an asset management standpoint, which again is largely what we do, it's, it's cheaper in the long run to, to do it this way. You know, we can take in that public consideration, but we got to make a decision that's best for all parties. And, and that's where I think this kind of mechanism kind of fails a lot because we try to like appease everybody and, and really you end up in this lose-lose situation that doesn't get you anywhere. And, and you know, an example of that is uh, I, I was working on a road diet project and, and, you know, we wanted this like letter of intent from or letter of support from the city saying like, oh, we're on board with this, you know, and then they can take it to their city council and kind of go to bat for us. 
but we told them like, um, you know, the delay is negligible, the, we know safety goes up, we know, um, you know, this is safer, this is better for, for your non-motorized users, your active transportationists. So we believe this is the right thing to do. And, and you know, from an asset management standpoint, that's two less lanes that we got to maintain in the long run. You know, there's all these reasons that this is a good idea. Whether you like it or not, we're probably going to move forward because we think it's the right thing to do for all users. And, and you really need to have people in this position that are willing to make those decisions and, and move forward, even when it's uncomfortable. If it truly is the right thing to do, you know, engineers are smart people, planners are smart people, uh, believe it or not. <laughs> um, they can figure these things out and they know what the right answer is, but we try to play this politics game of, of satisfying everybody and it just doesn't work. So, you, you know, you, you can speak with those homeowners till you're blue in the face and you'll never get anywhere. You need a, a strong local leader to, to make that decision and move forward. And that's really where you should be, in my opinion, focusing your efforts is, is you know, kind of lobbying, you know, those local leaders or, or activating those local leaders to, to see it that way. Our local leaders are very willing to use their political capital in order to preserve parking on the street. So in that case, you know, if they're, so they're scared of homeowners and they're scared of business owners yes. and homeowners, I hate, I don't want to exclude anyone. Homeowners are probably not the battle that you want to fight on this one or in these kind of cases, business community. Uh, you you probably hear me say business community community and you're thinking adversarial but they can be your friend and in fact they can be your best friend if, if you can build that re relationship over time i know it sounds crazy i've been in these heated you know personal conversations where like you're just completely at odds but from a city standpoint the the business community has more pull than almost anybody everything they do is centered you know parking is centered around the business community the festivals is centered around, you know, the business community and stimulating that local economy. Everything they do is about that. And, and that extra lane that's out there, that extra, you know, shoulder space, that sidewalk space, the curb space, it, realistically, that's the domain of, of the business community. They can say whether they want parking or they want a bike lane, you know, and if you can convince them that one is better than the other, you know, if you convince them, you've convinced everybody. So that's, you know, that's an incredible tool. If you can, it's not easy to do, I'm not saying that, but if you can get aligned with them and, and highlight cases where, you know, in certain cities, when, when you had a protected bike lane, um, you get more of a circulation as, as compared to a, a commuter type transportation system. And those tend to spend more. Uh, you get these users that spend less on each individual trip, but they make more trips. So they spend more overall. And if, and if you can show those numbers to them and, and show that your sales go up, your revenue go up, your, your foot traffic goes up because of this, not because of parking or not because of people flying through your town at 45 miles an hour. Um, it, you know, if you can convince them that, that it's worth it to do that and it's in their best interest, you've convinced the entire city to, to get on board with that. So it's, it's definitely something worth exploring if at all possible. Yeah, I think it's a great suggestion. It's, it's, uh, with, you know, the community meetings and people working full-time jobs and everything, it's, we're definitely stretching ourselves thin, but we are trying. One of the cool things recently, uh, one of our organizations did was make these postcards that we can take to a business and say, hey, I rode here. I like your yeah. establishment. Um, you know, we need to support safe infrastructure. So hopefully we'll, uh, you know, the pandemic kind of put a dent in some of the person-to-person -person interactions, but hopefully we can kind of start to do more of that coming up. Definitely. And that's what it's all about is just being out there and, and taking up space, you know, being visible, taking up that lane. So you have that conversation of like, hey, you want me out of the way? Let's, let's do something about it. You know, but let's do it in a way that, you know, benefits me as well. Sure. So, yeah, definitely. Uh, it seems like uh, for some reason, the unmute feature is not working for folks. Are there any more questions we have out there? Scoping out the chat right now. Do we get to Lauren or no, sorry, we got, my bad. 
Have you, I'm curious if uh, we have a few advocates that really like um, uh, tactical urbanism. Does that stuff ever find its way into DOT offices? Does it make a dent, make an impression? I mean, <coughs> excuse me. Yes and no. Just by nature, I think it's more like city oriented. So even though, um, you know, obviously we have roads that go through cities and they're, you know, state owned roads, they're really, it, 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 which is another misconception. We really let the city kind of run wild with, with those roads, even though they're like, you know, DOT owned roads, they have a lot of control over what gets done on them and that they really handle that stuff. Um, once in a while, they'll ask us for some guidance. I get more, um, city is actually coming to us and like doing their own kind of tactical urbanism now than, than we ever used to, which is, is pretty interesting. Uh, they're always kind of tinkering with things and, um, you, you know, and, and they listen, you know, they, I've, I've convinced the people in my area, you know, at least that, you know, when, when somebody comes or an advocacy group comes and they want, like, they're having trouble, you know, cross getting across a crosswalk or something like a mid block crossing or something like you don't have to commit to like a full curb redesign uh, you know, right off the bat, you know, you can put out some flex posts, you can put out some paint, you know, there's a lot of things you can do. And, and I think they're just starting to realize the power of that, of, of how cheap it is. And, you know, and, and it kind of gets them off the hook because the reason they're reluctant to do a lot of these things are because nobody wants to be seen as like wasting public resources. If you, if you do this, you know, pop up bike lane or something for, you know, what's perceived as like two users, you know, if, if you, if you do it permanently, like, you're like, what, what are you thinking? You know, you, that's such a waste of money. But if you do it, you know, cheaply with, you know, a lot of times with stuff you already have, you know, every you know, city DOT has like, you know, some delineators, they have some paint, they have some striping. You can, you know, with those cheap tools, you can, can do quite a bit. And, and it's seen like as a frugal way. And then you can kind of do a proof of concept. I, I mean, you know, you guys know what these pilot projects and like tactical ur urbanism does. You can prove that it works before you commit resources and, and cities are, are uh, really figuring the, out the power of that. And I think it's uh, a huge benefit. So what I, what I get more often now is, is them coming to us like, Hey, we want to kind of try this thing. Like we don't really know how to do it though. So then we, you know, sit down and have the conversation of like, you know, what we're comfortable with as a DOT or, or uh, you know, you know, some things we've seen in the past, cause we work with a lot of cities, they stay focused on their own area. Whereas we, like I say, we're in 21 counties just in my you know, office. So, you know, we see how things are done and, and offer up suggestions or examples for them to go look at and, and you know, people to call, things like that. So it's, uh, it's definitely an interesting time for the tactical urbanism front. So. Looks like there's one more question for you in the chat if you see that one at the bottom there. Arena, have you seen the <clears throat> project change the most? community meetings, city council pressure, or regulatory agency comments? All of the above. You know, for any given project, these are all the, um, the, the tensions that are present, you know, the, the confounding kind of constraints. You know, obviously if a regulatory agency has a comment, it, you know, we kind of just say sure, because <laughs> they're, they're in the you know, control of the money. And usually it makes sense. You know, we don't get bullied around too much. Um, city council that, that's kind of where it starts in the and again i'm speaking to more like urban settings you know like i say they we we manage pavement all day long forever if you know if, if there's nothing underneath it and nothing ever changed in the city we just manage pavement you know mill it up and repave it all forever so for a project to happen it really has to be derived from like the city and a lot of times it's the city manager and city mayor that we work with but they're answering to the city council so they're you know, I, with a grain of salt, I'm trying to say that they're like kind of a unified front. They have an idea of what they want. They bring, <coughs> excuse me, bring it to us and, and we kind of navigate through, through how that works. Um, by the time it gets to community meetings, I mean, there's not as much wiggle room as, as people like to believe. Um, you know, though we have these engagement meetings, which really aren't engagement meetings at all. They're just boxes that have to be checked. And you know, the dirty little secret is that like most engineers don't want to do them either because they, they know like this freight train is moving and like planners have already identified what, you know, uh, traffic flows will work in an area. The city has already identified what they want to do with an area, you know, how they want to use that space. 
And where, you know, us as a, the state DOT is kind of working on the assumption that the city knows kind of what's, what the residents want, what the business owners want, what the community wants. And like, for us to overstep them, it gets very tricky, you know, cause we don't want to second guess them cause they're, they're supposed to be our partners, but you know, I, I like to have those city council meetings in, I like to do them in such a way that we're out in the, the street when we have them. I do a lot of walking meetings and like, you know, I'll start like pointing out drainage or like this crosswalk over here. Then I'll make them run across the street, you know, and just to see what it's like. You know, I don't even want to do anything over there. I just want them to run across the street and they'll be like carrying their clipboard and their dockers and like, you know, whatever and like dropping stuff and trying to make it and trying not to get run over. I'm like, yeah, this is what it's like to like try to do your business on a street like this. You know, do we want to do something here and kind of make them live it? Because typically it's, um, you know, people that drive to work or, you know, or, or got to get across town to get their lunch on time and, or this and that, you know, those, those are the things they care about and those are their commute patterns. So I force them <clears throat> into these situations where it's kind of like a little bit, you know, unusual for them and un uncomfortable for them. So they see it from a different perspective. And if you can do that and do it, you know, enough or in a way that, you know, you get a taste of what's actually happening in the community, hopefully you've kind of drilled down to like what the community ne actually needs you know, where, where the gaps are, where the barriers are, that kind of thing. Of course, you know, we don't catch all of it. You know, we never will. And it, I don't know, at, at, just at that point, like we do the best job we can at that point. And when we have the community meetings, it's more like a notification meeting. Like, this is what we're planning to do. You know, you can try to talk us out of it, but it's, it's just not gonna, you know, like we, the, those decisions have already been made <laughs> and, and it's tough. You know, is it fair? I don't know. Probably not. But no, I don't know. I don't know if that even answered the question. <laughs> so, oh, Rob, Rob, are you on mute? Yes, I am. Sorry. Um, we uh, we do attend a lot of community meetings and and get very, definitely get that sense. So it's interesting to hear that from you too. Um, I know it's not what you wanted to hear. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I think we're getting close to the, to the hour here and I do want you to still have a voice when you're going to work tomorrow. So, um, I think we'll wrap it up here, but I really appreciate you coming and talking to us and kind of giving some insight from your world. Cause it is not something we hear a lot. Um, and if you ever make it to Denver, please let us know we'll buy you a beer when you get here. Sounds great. Sounds great. Awesome. So, um, you can find, uh, Dustin it's at engineer Dustin on Twitter, correct? Yep. And uh, I recommend following him and uh, taking a look at the books that are on his desk that he, he'll take a picture of sometime, I'm sure. And I uh, really appreciate you stopping by. So thanks so much. Well, I appreciate the invite and uh, all the great questions. Awesome. Have a Thank good you, one. Boston.